Hey everyone, it's Pojo. Welcome back to our uh, vlog type vacation filler. Today we're going to be talking about the Scions, and we're going to be doing a bit of a lore refresher. So we're going to be talking about each of these five characters, their lore, uh, what their deal is basically, uh, what they do in the story, and where they're at right now. Um, so first things first, uh, what is a Scion? A Scion is effectively a any of the main characters to some extent, of Eternal, who are in some way related to the Eternal Throne, with potentially one exception, who we'll be talking about as we get to the Justice Scions. But um, yeah, basically all five of the original Scions have some link to the Eternal Throne, uh, basically by right of blood. The original Scion is Kyphus, Wandering King, who is not in set one because he has vanished at the start of Eternal Storyline, but each of the other Scions is in some way related to Kyphus uh, by blood, and we'll be talking about their relation to them in some way. So in some senses, Eternal is a game about political intrigue in the same way that like Game of Thrones is a show about political intrigue but it's also a very high fantasy a lot of stuff is happening there's a lot of uh, unusual things going on but yeah this game does have power and influence as central themes and these are characters who wield a lot of power and influence in the eternal world so to start with Kyphus wandering king uh, Kyphus and Talir are sort of the two sort of most notable scions in terms of like overall longevity they've been around the longest most likely although it's a little bit hard to say since uh, Roland is Kyphus's uncle and Kyphus has been sitting on the throne for no one is quite sure. It seems like both Talir and Kyphus are a little bit older than they look. Kyphus has that delightful silver hair thing going on, and Talir is also somewhat equivalently timeless. Um, but basically, they are the ruler, the Kyphus is the ruler of Argenport, and by some respects, the ruler of the world of Myria, since the Eternal Throne is a seat of power in Myria, and Argenport, to some extent, has a very significant degree of control over other areas of the world. Uh, that's not wildly uh, delineated, but in general, Argenport is something of a center for Myria. It's a port city. Uh, the Eternal Throne sits there, and the Eternal Throne is very important for most people. Uh, and when it comes calling, comes time to call on other nations, uh, it seems that Argentport can get the job done, something we'll talk about a little bit with Roland. Um, so yeah, Kyphus seats uh, the Eternal Throne, and at the start of set one, he vanishes. Uh, something <laughs> that's, that's basically the, uh, the opening to the Avatar. Uh, yes, but anyways, uh, so yes, this is, he's uh, the sort of main character in that respect because he's, his Absence is the notable inciting incident for all of the conflict that occurs in Argenport from then on out, and also for the splitting of the other scions into their individual stories. Kyphus uh, basically is seated on the Eternal Throne. He is the his right hand of sorts is an advisor named Azendel that is a Radiant, and the Radiant gives him poor advice, and when he is assaulted by a number of strangers, he activates the Eternal Throne, and this in some way causes him to be tossed in into a mystical dimension called the Shadowlands, which is a bridge between dimensions, amongst other things, and also a dangerous encroachment upon reality that is very hard to deal with in some respects. Kyphus is now currently wandering the Shadowlands. He has been for quite some time. He was briefly reunited with his daughter Vara, but uh, has not made major appearances in the storyline since that appearance, and has not returned to the throne to claim power by any means. Uh, the first couple of chapters or sets are generally focused on the struggle for power uh, as Roland seizes the throne and other characters with better claims to it make some sort of attempts to take it back. So that's Kyphus. Uh, all right, so uh, Kyphus is, his sister is Talir, who is the Archmagister of the Praxis Arcanum up to a certain point. Talir is uh, similarly around Kyphus's age most likely, but uh, to what extent that is, is a little bit uncertain. Uh, she is 
a character who basically is concerned with the pursuit of knowledge. The Praxis Arcanum is a group of mages that are uh, primarily concerned with excavating, collecting, and utilizing magic. Uh, they basically are responsible for sort of unearthing the Sentinels, which are age-worn technology that has been around for a very long time. They're probably in some way related to the resurgence of dinosaurs, although what dinosaurs are doing in the storyline is not 100% clear. Most assumably, some timey-wimey nonsense is happening. Uh, and in general, they are sort of passive and rather remote observers to the political intrigues of the rest of society. Talir's deal is not so much focused on the political aspects of Eternal, but more on the... Uh, larger threats, perhaps, or at least the more metaphysical threats of Azendel and the Strangers and the Shadowlands. Talir is interested in finding out what is going on with reality itself and determining what sort of problems are related to that. To that end, she investigates Sentinels and the Waystones, which are the small stones that dot the Shadowlands that allow travelers to pass through them uh, most likely unharmed, although the Shadowlands are still very dangerous places. She also learns to tap into the power of those Waystones, and in doing so, goes full Super Saiyan, uh, reduces her age by a considerable amount, and becomes aware of past, present, and future in ways that are not uh, immediately clear. Upon doing all this, Talir returns to the Eternal Throne, where she encounters uh, Caleb and Aileen in conflict, which we will be talking about next, uh, after we discuss a little bit of Roland. But in general, what Talir is doing is getting things done because she's a super big nerd, and this is probably my favorite character in Eternal. She's really delightful and uh, definitely does a lot of cool things in terms of the overall plot. Uh, just just a get shit done kind of character. Uh, okay, next up, Roland. So, when Kyphus exits the Eternal Throne, uh, there are many different characters who have claims to the throne in some way. Uh, Caleb has uh, some extent is to some extent the bastard child of Kyphus, so uh, he potentially could have a claim to the throne were it not for the fact that the throne is reserved for Vara, who is much less interested in the throne but has a blood and contractual right to the throne in Kyphus's absence. Uh, Aileen is still alive and is effectively the queen. Uh, she is married to Kyphus and uh, Roland and Aileen do not get along, most likely because Aileen has previously conquered the city and Roland is uh, in charge of security of the city. So uh, most likely there has been at least one humiliating defeat there, but also Roland does not like uh, Aileen for a wide variety of reasons and does not want her to be on the throne. So. Uh, he has objections to basically everyone else being on the throne and takes it upon himself to sort of take control in the absence of all of these characters. Uh, everyone else is sort of out of the city or leaves the city after Kyphus' disappearance for different reasons, so Roland is the person in charge of Argenport for the first couple of sets. To this extent, he does a pretty spectacularly bad job. There is a mounting rebellion against the throne that uh, may have begun before Kyphus has started up, but is certainly made no happier by Roland's generally fascistic tendencies. He is uh, not a kind or benevolent ruler. He is a rule by force kind of type. Uh, he is the person who is responsible for the creation of the Valkyries, who are flying sky soldiers that are cybernetically augmented in what appears to be a very painful process uh, to become basically panopticon, uh, scary angel guardians who hover over and watch everybody from above. Uh, he's not a nice guy, but uh, Roland generally does uh, does like succeed, I guess, in maintaining order in the city for a short period of time. He makes ties with the Cabal, the crime lords of the city, in addition to calling in reinforcements from the Cambrai Colleges and other places. Um, and when the rebellion comes, he channels the power of the Eternal Throne to create the event known as the Harsh Rule, which wipes out an entire quadrant of the city, kills the rebellion, and also kills everyone in that section of the city, leaving a devastated ruin and a lot to clean up. Roland is not a nice man. Um, but with the rebellion stopped, Roland 
continues to sort of slowly lose control. Uh, people rebel against him. There are riots in the streets. He turns to a sort of blood and circuses or bread and circuses type uh, setup to try to keep people appeased as conditions get worse and worse. And eventually he is ousted by the cabal and then killed in what I think is one of the more emotionally resident moments of the storyline. Uh, I would highly recommend checking out the campaigns because this one is, I believe it's, I'm not sure if it's called Jack's Bounty. I think it's, it's I think it's the one after Jack's Bounty. It's, um, uh, it's the Acaria one, but uh, I, I do recommend that one because it's a really solid storyline and it also does include uh, the end of Roland as a scion. When Roland is done as a scion, another green scion does arise. This is Svetcha Lightbringer, whose association with the other scions is not by blood, uh, but is more a sort of Anastasia battle princess story about someone retaking their own throne uh, when Argenport refuses to do anything due to the chaos and tumult. Svetch's story is pretty much entirely encapsulated in Defiance, uh, another campaign. Uh, it's certainly worth a look. She won't be a main focus, but she probably will be a main focus in future sets as she's the current living incarnation of the Justice Scion. Uh, but yeah, the one character who is not currently related by blood out of all of the Scions. All right, so Roland has control of the throne, but people with perhaps a better right to the throne include Ailin. Ailin's story goes back to before the set starts. Uh, Ailin is a member of the Skycrag clans and is sometimes known in a pejorative sense as the Queen of the Wilds, as well as perhaps in a respectful sense, but it's uh, definitely uh, used in Argenport as something of a, uh, you know, this is the savage barbarian queen. Uh, she comes from a place where basically the clans are determined their leader through strength, and she rose to the top of those uh, leadership of that leadership position, took the clans to war with Argenport, and won. And when that happened, she married Kyphus, uh, established peace between the clans and Argenport, and then effectively chose to rule with uh, Caleb uh, by first uh, excommunicating Caleb in some senses, removing Caleb's claim to the throne, and then also ensuring that uh, Caleb, uh, Kyphus, and Island's daughter Vara would have the appropriate claim to the throne. Vara is something of a bad seed, so there are issues with that particular uh, sort of uh, sort of interaction. But at the same time, uh, Island may have the best sort of claim to the throne in terms of general like uh, legal right and also by right of conquest. Um, when Island leaves temporarily, uh, and Kyphus disappears. Aelin is not allowed back into the city, and at that point she has to provide refugee support to many of the people who are fleeing the city in the wake of Roland's harsh rule and in the wake of the rebellion. She enlists the aid of the Huru in this, but also eventually leads herself back to the Skycrag clans, uh, is rejected by them as well, and has to sort of re-establish herself uh, through right of conquest once again and through uh, challenging her brother Vadius to a duel. Um, then she establishes herself as the leader of the clans once again, and once again she leads the clans to war against Argenport. As Roland has just lost control of power, she takes the city, uh, once again a somewhat bloody battle, and once again declares a f an effective peace. Uh, they, she tries to integrate the clans into the city a little bit better and sort of repair the damages that have been wrought, but as a person who has conquered the city twice and is not viewed necessarily as the, uh, sort of, <laughs> and is viewed as a conquering, uh, sort of scion, uh, it maybe does not have the respect of the populace in the way that other, uh, potential scions might. So uh, yeah, Aelin's issues tend to relate to uh, her sort of general 
demeanor and actions leading to a lot of backlash against her. Uh, there are there are many characters who do not like her and who view her as like too warlike or in some ways like just creating different problems. Uh, that is sort of like the thing that she struggles against. However, she's also something of a badass and has frequently proven herself in a lot of different uh, ways. A really cool character. Uh, I'm a big fan of this one and uh, yeah, Basically, all of this leads to a very interesting interaction between her and Caleb, which is the culmination of Caleb's story. All right, Caleb, claimless. Now, as we mentioned, Caleb is the bastard child of Caiaphas, which is to say that he is not the true-born heir, uh, does not belong to Aileen, and does not indeed know who his mother is. His storyline primarily involves leaving Argenport in the wake of Caiaphas's disappearance in an attempt to find his mother's name and re-establish his own claim to the throne, since Vara does not take it, and uh, Aileen is currently uh, not uh, around. So Caleb exits, uh, follows a series of riddles and uh, very riddlesome mages, as well as other different puzzles to a caldera in the top of a mountain, where he dives into the caldera, finds a sunken tower that contains clones of Caiaphas, many of whom look a lot like him, and thus discovers that he is a clone of Caiaphas. Uh, what that determines to us about Caiaphas is very uncertain, but it does determine that Caleb does not have a mother, that he is in fact his own heir, or rather that he is his own father, and he considers that his claim to the throne and returns to the throne uh, of Argenport. At this point, Aileen has already retaken Argenport, so he does a very clever thing. The only very clever thing that we see Caleb do, I believe, over the course of the storyline, and he challenges Aileen to trial by combat under the laws of the Skycrag people. The two of them get into a fight, and as they are fighting over who gets to control the throne, Talir, who has been uh, just recently wandering through the Shadowlands and sort of generally doing her thing, appears to warn them of a greater threat and to try and sort out the difficulties that the two of them have. As a result, uh, the two enter into a mutual agreement to rule together with the addition of Vara, who has just returned home from a lengthy trip to the Shadowlands. Uh, so, what we end up with is a triumvirate. Caleb, Aileen, and Vara, with Talir advising. Vara, our last character, uh, is the true-born heir of the throne, but also perhaps the least suited. She is very violent and uh, generally uh, impetuous, uh, often acts as sort of like the bratty teenager, but in most instances has been uh, interacting with the Shadowlands in ways that are a little bit upsetting and uh, somewhat worrisome for her mental health. Lost her memories to Azendel, who uh, functioned as her guide for the first part of her trip into the Shadowlands to discover more about them, um, and then spent a lot of time chasing Azendel as revenge for the uh, perceived loss of memories, which I believe she had returned to her. That gave her like a little moon-shaped scar in her sort of neck area, I believe from the pendant that Azintel gave her, and also like this pursuit has generally made her a bit more brash and focused on revenge. A lot of the scenes with Vara, or at least a lot of the art of Vara, features her doing some pretty nasty things to people's heads and uh, generally manipulating some fairly dark magic. Uh, so yeah, she's Shadowlands, she's focused somewhat on power, uh, she is very much about like seizing control and sort of defining her own destiny. When she returns to the throne, uh, she is the first person to try to use the throne. Um, at the time, the throne is occupied by a nightmare called uh, Aramot, due to the events of the Flame of Zulta set, which are not related to the Scions. Um, and uh, basically, this causes her to plunge into a sort of nightmare version of her own Argent port, which is the Argent Depths set. So in the Argent Depths set, Caiaphas is alive and well, Aileen is under lock and key, uh, and it does not have the claim to the throne that you ex would expect. Caleb has the actual claim to the throne and is a villain of the story, and uh, Roland is alive? 
sort of, but is mostly a very creepy zombie, which uh, you will see in the 2-5 Decay Roland that is featured in Argent Depths. Uh, that's where we're at right now. Vara has used the throne against the better uh, advice of many of her peers, but has basically been like being something of a go-getter and trying to sort of establish uh, what is going on and fight the threat and uncover the secrets of what is going on with the strangers and what is going on with the Shadowlands. Um, so that leaves us with uh, this character who has sort of uh, gone off on her own and channeled powers that maybe she shouldn't have, and as a result uh, we are left with the Argent Depths, which is this sort of twisted mirror universe of Argentport, uh, which is either Vara's dream world or is an actual real thing that is happening, and whether or not that's true is something we will determine as the story goes on. But that's where we're left with Vara. So, uh, of the five Scions, it's notable that you should keep track of the Triumvirate, uh, Aelin, Caleb, and... Um, Aileen, Caleb, and, oh man, Farah, all function as uh, sort of the current de facto rulers of the Eternal Throne. Roland is dead. Uh, Talir is functioning as an advisor, but is mainly concerned with battling the things that are going on in the Shadowlands. And Svetcha is the ruler of her own separate nation state of uh, somewhat equivalent, but uh, slightly equal power, perhaps, to Argentport. So functioning in sort of her own sort of aspect of justice and bringing about like rulership and order in Muria. Um, th those are the different characters. Uh, whether or not they have a positive impact on the world around them is sort of up to your own personal judgment and sort of how you view the storyline or interpret the storyline. To some extent, there's a lot of room for interpretation in this storyline. There is uh, Most of the events are not written down, but often are set in sort of uh, different images of what's going on in the the actual world. But if you want to read more about the world, it is available on the Eternal website. Uh, highly recommend going and checking it out. So yeah, that's the Scions, and that's some of the basic storyline of what's been going on in Eternal. Thanks for watching, everyone. I will see you all next time, and hopefully we'll be back on Thursday. See you soon.